Hi there, everyone. This is Hannah at the Blue Hill Library. And I'm going to take you through my presentation on next level Gmail skills for keeping your Gmail inbox organized. So the basic topics I'm going to cover today include what I'm calling the basic three functions of Gmail, different tools you can use to sort and organize, ways that you can search and filter your emails, composition tools for when you're writing emails, and then a bit of a dive into preferences and settings that you can adjust in Gmail. As just a quick programming note, this presentation is going to be covering Gmail's webmail interface. So if you typically um, use your check your email through an email client like Apple Mail or Outlook, even if you have a Gmail address, this isn't going to be as relevant to you. Most of these functions exist on most email platforms and programs, but um, the actual sort of click by click directions we're going to be talking about today are going to be on the webmail interface for Gmail when you go to gmail.com to check your email in a web browser. So the basic three, uh, just to start with the very basics, these are three tools that you can use to help keep your inbox organized. They are deleting, reporting spam, and archiving messages. Deleting is really the number one way that you can keep your inbox free of clutter. I think a lot of people tend to save everything because it's easier to just let everything pile up, but uh, deleting is a great way to remove unwanted messages from your inbox. And I would encourage folks not to be too worried about deleting things, um, especially if they're not things that are, you know, personal communications between two actual humans, but promotions, newsletters, messages like that. Um, if you decide later that you want to find some of that information again, it's usually available somewhere on that organization's website. So I wouldn't worry too much about deleting. If you do want to delete a message, there's a couple different ways you can go about it. If you're in your inbox view here, you wanna check off the message using the checkbox. At that point, this bar of tools will appear at the top of the screen and you want to click on the little trash can icon in order to delete the message. You can also select multiple messages at once to delete, either by checking them off individually or by clicking on the checkbox at the very top of the list, which allows you to select an entire page of messages at once. Another way that you can delete if you don't wanna check off the message first, if you move your mouse on top of the message in your inbox, these buttons will pop up on the right side of the message. And again, you can just click the trash can to delete an individual email using that method. Reporting spam is uh, one way to make Gmail better at filtering out unwanted messages. So rather than just delete something, if it's really uh, malicious, you know, um, unsolicited, uh, messages trying to get you to buy something, um, things that look like scams. Uh, the great thing to do is to actually mark those as spam so that Gmail not only knows not to deliver them to you, but not to deliver them to any of their users in the future. And you can do that in a really similar way. You check off the message in your inbox, but instead of clicking the trash can icon, you're going to click the little exclamation point right next to it. That will mark the message as spam, which moves it out of your inbox, as well as alerting Gmail to the fact that they should filter out messages like that in the future. And when you delete or mark things as spam, they do stay uh, in your email for a little while, I believe 30 days. If you look at that left-hand sidebar where it says inbox, starred, snoozed, et cetera, it's cut off in this picture, but there are additional uh, mailboxes there. One is trash. That's where any deleted messages will end up for 30 days until they're automatically deleted forever. And there's another called spam, which is where messages that Gmail already thinks um, should be marked as spam go until either they're automatically deleted or you go in and manually delete those. And again, you can use the checkbox at the top of the page if you wanna check off an entire page worth of messages to do something to all at once. And just thinking about what is spam, um, this is a not exhaustive list, but some examples from the FTC 
things that are common spam messages over email, bogus business opportunities, health and diet scams, easy money, free goods, investment opportunities, bulk email schemes, cable descrambler kits, which I think is an interestingly specific topic that people tend to try to scam others about, any kind of guaranteed loans or credit, as well as phishing and social engineering, which are when someone's pretending to be a legitimate source that you actually know, but it's not really coming from their real email address. So watch out for those kinds of things and make sure to mark them as suspicious. As a quick side note on the topic of spam, um, you don't have to mark as spam reputable kinds of newsletters and promotions that you're getting from real companies that legitimately you know, got your email address because you use their service in some way. You can just unsubscribe from those. So whereas spam is you interacting with Gmail to say, don't let more of this type of message come through, unsubscribing is you interacting directly with the sender of the message just why you only want to do it if it's coming from a reputable source, but usually somewhere at the bottom of their message, buried in all of this text, there will be a link to unsubscribe. You can click on that and then they'll stop sending you the messages altogether. And last of the big three is archiving. Uh, archiving will remove messages from your inbox without deleting them. So this is a nice tool to use if you don't feel like you need to organize your inbox with lots of labels or folders. You just want to move messages that you no longer need to see somewhere else. Um, it puts them in sort of generic all mail land. Again, on that left hand sidebar where you see different options for your inbox, et cetera. One of those options, if you scroll all the way down and expand out the menu for more options, is going to be all mail. And that's where messages that you've archived will be. You can also search for them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. To archive a message, uh, similarly, you can just check it off. And then the archive button is to the left of this report spam button. It's that little box with a down arrow in it. And again, you can check off a whole page of messages if you want to archive a lot at once by clicking the checkbox at the top of the page. And just like deleting, if you hover over a message in your inbox, just move your mouse right over the message, then some of those buttons will pop up over on the right. And one of those is also the archive option. So those are the basic ways that you can start to control uh, where messages are going in your inbox. If you want to get a little bit more advanced than that, I'm going to go over some additional features you can use to sort and organize your email. Uh, we're going to talk about snoozing and muting messages, different ways that you can um, visually mark your message in your inbox, such as marking it unread using stars and the important designation, the inbox categories, and then spend a, quite a bit of time on labels. So to start out with snooze and mute, these are two features that will make messages disappear from your inbox. Snooze will make them disappear for a set period of time. So if you ever get an email and you're in the middle of working on something else and you see this new email come through and you just think, I can't deal with this right now, I don't even want to see it, um, you don't want to file it away anywhere because you're worried that you might not remember to go retrieve it. One good option is that you can snooze it. And this will basically make it go away <laughs> from your inbox until such a time as you would like it to reappear. So again, you can check off the message using the checkbox. And the snooze button is this clock icon on that top menu bar. When you click on that, it will give you several options uh, for how long you want to snooze it until. You can use one of these preset options or pick your own date and time. When you do snooze something, it will go into the snoozed category on that left-hand sidebar. So if you snooze it and then you finish what you were working on sooner than you thought and you want to see it earlier than you had scheduled it to show up, you can find that snoozed category on the left-hand sidebar and any messages you've snoozed will be in there. Mute is a little bit different. It will remove new messages in that conversation from your inbox until you decide to unmute. So this might be 
if you're on uh, one of many recipients on a big email thread and lots of people keep replying back and you don't need to be kept informed of what everyone else is continuing to say, that might be a good situation in which you want to mute the conversation. If you've gotten everything you need out of that email conversation, you don't need to see any more, you can mute it. That will make it so that new messages that people are replying to that old message from won't keep showing up in your inbox. So similarly, you want to select the message and then mute is a little bit more hidden. It's under these three dots on that toolbar on top. Click on that to expand out some options and then select mute from the list that shows up. Muted messages can be a little bit harder to find because they don't get their own special mailbox like snoozed messages do. But again, um, just like with messages that you've archived, you can find them in all mail. So on that left-hand sidebar, you scroll all the way down to the bottom, click where it says more, and then uh, keep going down a little bit and there is the all mail uh, category. And in your list of all your mail, this will be all the email that you've sent or received. Uh, any messages that you have muted will show up with the little label that says muted on them in the list. If you'd like to unmute a message, you can select it from that list. Again, go to those three dots and that menu will pop up and you can select unmute. And that will just undo it. It'll start behaving like normal emails again new replies will show up in your inbox from there. Next, I'm going to talk about a few ways that you can distinguish messages when looking at them from your inbox. One of these is by marking email as unread. So you may have noticed in your inbox that new messages that you've received but haven't opened yet will be bold, uh, whereas ones that you've already clicked on to open and read will no longer be bold. If you would like to take a message that you've already opened and make it bold again to give it that unread look, then you want to click the mark as unread button. And in this case, I'm showing you the example from having the message open. So, um, you know, you get those same tools popping up across the top, whether you have selected the message in your inbox view or actually opened the message and are reading it. And either way, whichever place you're in, you want to click that little envelope icon to mark it unread, and then it will be bold in your inbox again. You can also use stars to make the emails visually stand out from each other in your inbox. Just click on the little star, buy an email, and that will fill in the icon as yellow. And you can decide to apply that however you want using whatever criteria makes sense to you. Um, it's totally up to you. You could decide, okay, all my email from family, I want to star. Uh, and if you decide you want to unstar something, you don't want it to have that star icon filled in anymore, just click the star again and it will go back to being transparent. And you can see on the uh, left hand sidebar there, there's a special mailbox for starred messages, so they'll also show up there. The last sort of big way you can visually distinguish your messages in your inbox is this important marker. It's that chevron icon right next to the star. And similarly, clicking on that will fill it in yellow. Clicking on it again will make it transparent and therefore not important. And um, Google automatically tries to fill this one in for you. So whereas stars are totally up to you, which ones you want to star or not star, the important marker, Google will try to use your actions um, to predict what you're going to find important and fill it in or not fill it in automatically based on that. So that's what it does by default. It monitors your behavior to decide if it thinks a message is important. And you can turn that off in your inbox settings, which we'll look at a little bit later. Manually changing the marker in this case by clicking it will teach Google a little bit more about what you think is actually important. So um, if you do choose to use these importance markers, you manually going in and adjusting them to look the way you want, Google will eventually learn from that what you want them to look like and start to be more accurate the way that it automatically applies. And again, those will show up in a mailbox off to the side. This one's called important. 
And just as a quick note, Google automatically has these three tabs across the top of your regular inbox, primary, social, and promotions. And some people really like them. Some people would prefer to just have one inbox that all the messages come to. I just want to make sure you know that you can, in fact, remove them or you can add uh, additional tabs, one called updates and another called forums by clicking on the gear icon over on the right and selecting configure inbox from that list. And the deal with these categories, these tabs, is that Google will sort of automatically sort your mail into them for you. Um, so social is more intended for things like email notifications, for example, from Facebook or another social media. Uh, promotions is generally things like coupons, offers, newsletters, that kind of thing get automatically sorted there. You can move messages between these tabs if you think one has ended up in the wrong place. And again, that's the kind of thing that Google will learn over time. If you always move messages from Blue Hill Library out of promotions and into primary by clicking and dragging them into the other tab, then eventually it will learn, oh, they want Blue Hill Library messages to be showing up in their primary mailbox. So again, it's very much a personal preference thing, whether you like having these different categories or you want everything to show up in one place, you can decide which you want to leave checked off and which you might want to add. Okay, now we're going to get into the real bulk of the organizational tools, uh, labels. Labels are really the most powerful way that you can organize your emails in Gmail. Uh, a label, when you apply it to a message, will show this little designation next to the message subject line. So you can see in this example, the message in the middle does not have a label on it, just looks normal, but the messages on either side of it, one I've labeled Fisher House, the other I've labeled Personal, and um, those will show up in the inbox view and allow you to kind of distinguish between messages that way. Labels will also show up in that left-hand sidebar. So that's another way that you can stay organized. Everything that has the Fisher House label, if I click on the Fisher House in the left-hand sidebar, I'll get a list of all the messages that I've put that label onto. So if you want to create a label, you can do that using the left-hand sidebar. If you click on More, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the list again, and select Create a New Label. You could also do it sort of straight from the inbox, applying it directly to a message while you create the label. You can select the message, and then on that uh, toolbar that appears on the top, the label button is that last one in the list before the three dots. So click on that and then uh, type in what you want the label to be and click on create new as that pops up at the bottom. Either way, whether you go through the sidebar menu or by applying the label directly to the message, checking it off in your inbox, you will get this box that pops up uh, where you can enter the label name you can also decide if you want to nest labels. So if you'd like to have labels that sort of exist within other labels, uh, you can check off that nest label under and choose which label you want to be kind of the parent of the one that you're creating. You don't have to do that, um, but if you'd like to have that kind of Russian nesting doll approach, that's available. And then you click the Create button to actually officially create the label. So using that button that we showed a couple slides ago, the last one before the three dots, will apply the label to a message. But using this button next to it, which is the folder icon with a little arrow, will not only apply the label to the message you've selected, it will also move that message out of your inbox so it's only in the mailbox with that label on it. So I use this all the time. This is the primary way that I keep my inbox organized is that I move messages out of my inbox and into different labeled, Google doesn't call them folders, but even the icon here is a folder. So you can call them folders if you want. Um, Google calls everything labels, but uh, yeah, you move it out of your inbox and into that label or if you will, folder. 
And then uh, when you click that label on the left-hand sidebar, you'll see those messages still, but they won't be showing up in your inbox anymore to distract you if you don't need to do anything with them right now. So that's a pretty powerful tool. You can not only apply a label, but also move the message out of your inbox at the same time. So it's only accessible by looking at that label. And one last thing on labels, uh, you can go kind of as crazy as you want to with labels. If you hold your mouse over one of the labels on that left-hand sidebar, a three dot icon will appear to open up another menu with lots more options. This is where you can change the color of a label. So again, if you're a very visual person and you want ways to distinguish the messages visually in your inbox, this is a great option. Um, I showed an example there on the right of what it would look like if my Fisher House label was blue. That would mean that every message that I've labeled Fisher House, if that if someone responds to that email thread and it pops back up in my inbox, it would have that blue label already um, applied to it. And you can also decide if you want labels to show in that left-hand sidebar, the label list, um, all the time, or only if you've got unread messages in there, or not at all. So you can check whichever of those options make sense to you. This is also where you can remove a label. If you've created one and then you decide that, you know, you don't really need that label after all, just click on those three dots when you hover over the label in the sidebar and select remove label from this list. Um, and that will not get rid of the messages that you have filed under that label, but it will get rid of the label itself. So moving on to another topic, uh, searching and filtering are some more great tools in Gmail that you can use to find what you're looking for and keep your emails organized. We're gonna talk about search as well as advanced search and then a bit about filters you can create. So it should not be surprising that Gmail has a really good search function because Gmail is from Google and Google cut their teeth on being a search engine. So in the search bar at the top of your inbox, you can search for just about anything. You can search by sender, subject, keyword, whatever you want. Uh, you will see suggestions pop up as you start to type things in. A list of suggestions will appear. So I've typed in library in this example, and you can see a couple messages popped up that it thinks I might be looking for. The suggestions will be in uh, an order that Google thinks is most likely to be relevant to you. So it might say, okay, anything with that word in the subject line is gonna come first. And then maybe if it appears a couple times in the body of the message, those will be next. You don't have to select any of those suggestions. If you want to actually perform the search, you can hit the enter or return key on your keyboard. And that will actually perform the search and pull up a list of all the results, which will be chronological. So sometimes people get hung up on those suggestions, but you can run the full search and see anything that has that keyword included in it. Advanced search is also really useful if there's something specific that you're looking for. In the search bar, before you type anything in, you can click on the little carrot over on the right and that will bring up the advanced search fields. So this allows you to be more specific about what you're looking for. Um, if you want emails from a specific sender or to a specific email address, you could enter that into one of those first two fields. And it's got all these other options. Um, you could search you know, just for a subject line with a particular word or has these words in the email anywhere. You could say doesn't have to uh, exclude emails with certain words. Uh, the date search is really helpful and it allows you to indicate how close to the date you think it might be. So if you're not sure exactly when something was, but you know it was you know, within a week of a certain day, um, then it allows you to be a little fuzzy there. And you don't have to fill in all of these fields. Uh, it looks a little bit like a form that you should fill in everything, but really you only need to fill in uh, the most relevant thing that you're looking for. So you can simply fill in, uh, you know there's a certain keyword in the subject, you just type that word in subject, leave everything else blank, and then you can search that way. 
If you fill in more, you'll have fewer results because it will only be looking for emails that all of those different search terms apply to. So that's advanced search. And um, thinking about filters, filters actually start from exactly this same page. So if you want to create a filter, you can just open up that advanced search function. And you start, filters are rules that you create for Gmail to automatically uh, apply certain characteristics to the messages you receive for you. So you start out by uh, filling in, just like you would do in advanced search, you fill in certain criteria. Um, so for emails from a particular sender or uh, with a particular subject line, anything that has an attachment, et cetera, all of these options are on the table to set up a filter. Once you decide what you want your criteria to be and fill it in, instead of clicking the search button on the bottom, you're going to click right next to it where it says create filter. And once you do that, you'll see a screen that looks like this. Uh, and yeah, filters, as I said, can save you time because they'll automatically do certain things like label or delete certain messages as soon as they arrive. So I've put in, I want all messages from hannah.cyrus at bhpl.net. And this screen's asking me, what do you want Google to do with all those messages? So if you never want to hear from me again, you could check off delete it. And then any future messages from me at that email address would automatically be deleted before you even see them. Or if you wanted to, if you've started using labels to stay organized, you could check off apply the label and pick library or whatever label you would like to apply to my messages. Um, so all of these different options are uh, available for rules that you're creating with a filter. And there's lots of different ways that you can implement them. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you can check this last one, which says also apply filter to matching conversations to retroactively apply this filter. So if you don't check that box off, this will create a rule for what to do with certain emails going forward. If you check that box off as well, it will also apply that rule to any past messages that meet those criteria. So if you're starting to really dig into getting organized and you want to apply a certain label to all messages from a certain sender, you could create a filter to do that automatically going forward, check off that box, and it would also automatically do it to all the messages that are already in your inbox. So that's filtering. Next, I'm going to go through uh, the composition tools that Gmail offers. So um, there's quite a few things that you can do when you're actually writing your email. You can schedule a send. To, uh, I'm going to go over the different text editing tools. We'll talk about attachments and links in your emails, as well as inline images and then go over confidential mode. So you can schedule an email to send at a later date, which is a nice feature, especially if you're up later than you should be writing emails and you don't want people to know that you were up so late, you'd rather think that you were uh, up early in the morning. You could schedule your email to send at 8 a.m. the next day. Uh, all you need to do to do this is click on the little arrow right next to the word send. Instead of clicking on send, click on the arrow, and that will allow you to schedule a send. It'll give you a list of options, or you can enter in whatever date and time you want. You will need to have a recipient already put into your email for who you want to send it to before it will let you schedule it. So that's a nice feature. And uh, I'm also going to talk about Google's text editing tools. So you may have seen this when you are composing a message. One of the icons right next to the send button is that little A with an underline. If you click on that, it opens up this whole menu of options that you can use to make changes to your text while you're composing the email. You've got this undo and redo buttons. So if you accidentally delete a whole paragraph that you just wrote, you can click on the backwards facing button to undo that. Or if you realize you didn't want to undo it, you can click the forward button to redo it. You can change the font for your email. Uh, so just select the text you want to change the font of and click there to get a list of different fonts. 
You can also change the font size, make your text bigger or smaller. You've got bold, italics, and underline, just like you would see in any kind of word processor. And then this A with the line under it is going to open up options for changing the text and background color. So you could make your text blue, or you could make your text yellow with a black background. Um, that will open up all those options under that A. You've got options for alignment, if you'd like to center your text or left or right align it. An option to create an automatic numbered list so that each time you hit the enter key, the next number will automatically fill in. Then there's this little caret at some point that you can click to show the rest of the text editing options, including making an automatic bulleted list. This little guy, which allows you to indent your text, and then the one next to it that allows you to, I guess, outdent your text, if that's the opposite of indent, um, moves it back the other direction towards the edge. The quotation marks will format it as a little sort of inline quotation. So not only indent it, but put a vertical line next to it to make it look a little different from the rest of your text. The strike through option puts a line through the middle of the text as though it's been crossed out. And then my favorite one, which I actually use more than any of the others, is this remove formatting option. So often I'm copying some text from a different program or a different email, and I want to integrate it and make it look more like the rest of my email. If you have it selected and you click that remove formatting button, it will remove any other things, color, size, font, and just make it look like the rest of your default email. So those are the text editing tools available in Gmail's interface. Attachments and links are kind of the two ways that you can include non-email stuff in your email, um, send folks some other information. Uh, for attachments, you can click on the little paperclip icon and that will open up the window uh, whether you're on a Mac or a PC, it will open up a little browser window where you can select the file that you'd like to attach to the email. Gmail is also very good about allowing you to drag and drop. So if that's easier for you, you can have uh, a window with a list of files open on the side and just drag a file and drop it into the message anywhere and that will attach it. Links are more about sending someone the ability to go to a different website through your email. So in order to make a link um, appear as clickable text, you can type out what you wanna say, highlight the text that you want to turn into a clickable link, and then you click on the link button, which is like that little chain link icon. That will open up a window that I've shown in the upper right here and that's where you can paste in the web address. So you could put google.com or paste in a longer web address wherever you want that link to go. You can also just paste in a whole URL straight into your email without clicking on any buttons, and that will be automatically turned into a clickable link by Google when you send the email. But sometimes it's nice if you want to just make some actual part of your text clickable so that people don't have to look at that big long web address, you can do it this way. You can also put images in line in your email. So this is an example of me holding some tiny baby pants that I made. Uh, so this is a little bit different from attaching a picture. If you use the paperclip icon like we talked about before and attach a photo that way, it will be available for the recipient to download and look at that way but it won't show up in the text of your email like this one does. In order to do this, you're gonna to wanna to click the picture icon that sort of looks like a square with some mountains in it. That will similarly open up a kind of browser window for you to select the image you want, but when you do, instead of just attaching it on the side, it's gonna insert it right into the email. And the last tool I wanted to cover in kind of the composition tools is called confidential mode. This is a relatively new feature in Gmail, but you can use it to make your emails and anything you attach to them expire 
or um, you have the power to revoke them anytime you want. So if you have sensitive information that you're sharing with someone, this can be a nice feature to enable. It is this lock icon with a little clock next to it. Clicking that will turn on confidential mode. It allows you to set when you want that email to expire. After that date, the recipient won't have access to the email anymore. You can also choose if you would like to require a passcode. So they would not only have to be logged into their email and open the email, they would need to enter a passcode that Google will automatically text to the phone number associated with their account in order to read the email. So if you want to be extra secure and basically provide two-step verification um, for reading an email that you've sent, you could use the SMS passcode option. And confidential mode also means that uh, whoever receives the email will not be able to forward it on. They can't copy and paste from it print it out or download it. Um, this is good in terms of security, but I don't want to give anyone a false sense of security because it should be kept in mind that anyone who receives an email could still take a screenshot of it on their screen. So uh, there's no way to really totally make sure that no one could ever have a more permanent record of it. But this is a good way to um, help work around, you know, someone accidentally forwarding it, or if you just don't want them to print it out, um, then confidential mode can help a little bit with that. Once you've got confidential mode turned on, you'll see that everything sort of turned blue in your email, and it will have a note included with it that says when the content's going to expire based on what date you set. If you look in your sent messages after you have sent a confidential email, you will see again, it has that expiration date included in the message. And it also gives you the link there to remove access to it early. So if before May 12th, I wanted to rescind access to this message, I could click there and the recipient would immediately lose access to the message. So that's confidential mode, it's kind of wild, but uh, there's always something new with Google. Last but not least, I wanted to spend some time going through different preferences and settings that you can use to customize Gmail. We're gonna talk about Gmail's general settings, as well as some specific inbox settings and layout options. So one nice thing about Gmail is that you can adjust almost anything about the way it looks and works through your settings. You can click on the gear icon near the upper right of your inbox and select settings. That will take you to a big, long, sort of overwhelming list of different options. I'm not gonna go through all of them exhaustively, but I'm gonna talk about a few and kind of translate them into regular English so you can understand what your options are. One thing you can control is how many messages you want to show up on a page. Normally there will be 50, but you can set it to be more if you have a lot of emails in your inbox and you don't want to have to keep clicking onto the next page to go back, you can set more messages to show up on a single page. One thing that a lot of people who are relatively new to Gmail or used to other email services say to me is that they don't like the way that Gmail threads emails together. So normally uh, all messages under the same subject are grouped as people respond back and forth within that conversation, it continues to just show up as a single line in your inbox. And you have to click on that in order to see all the messages that fall under that subject heading. If you don't like that, if you'd rather have each individual reply show up as a separate uh, line in your inbox, you can turn this conversation view to off. How about, do you like seeing a preview of the message from your inbox? Um, so not only seeing the subject line, but next to that in a little bit less bold font, um, a little, you know, the first few words of what the message is. Some people really like that to get a sense of what the message is before they open it. Uh, other people find it distracting. So you can decide if you want to show those snippets as they're called or not. Gmail can also put uh, more indicators on an email to show if it is personal. 
So you can turn this on and off. If you have it on, it will put one little carrot by a message sent actually to your email address and not just to a list that you're on. And it'll put two little carrots by messages that are sent to you as the only recipient. So that's another way you can sort of visually uh, distinguish messages if you want to turn those indicators on. You can also create more options for stars. So if you start using that starred message option and you really like it and you wish that there were more different kinds of stars that you could use, there are. Uh, if you go into your settings, you can um, add all these different types of stars uh, to the retinue here. And instead of just being a on and off toggle, clicking on it will run through the different stars. So click it once to make it a yellow star, click it twice to make it orange, click it three times to make it red. And then if you click it again, it'll go back to clear, um, that kind of idea. So if you get into using stars, just know there's more options for all the more different kinds of stars you can use. What about for buttons, those buttons that we keep talking about that show up when you select a message? You can change them to be reading out as text instead of those icons. So just to show you what that looks like, that top uh, example is what we've been showing through this presentation, those little icons, trash can, exclamation point, et cetera. If you change this option to say text, they will show up as words. Um, so that can be a big help for folks who aren't used to knowing what those different icons mean. You can just have them be words in plain English. And uh, sometimes that's easier to find what you're looking for that way. Google also gives you the option to adjust how long you can have to undo your send. So when you send an email, a little box will pop up in the left-hand bottom corner of your screen that says email sent. And then there's a link there that says undo if you'd like to undo your send. So if you're the kind of person who, like me, sometimes realizes after you've sent something, oh shoot, I forgot to mention this, or oh no, I didn't mean to send that to that person, um, that undo feature can be a real lifesaver because it will sort of snatch the message back before it actually gets sent out and you can then edit it and do whatever you want to before actually sending it again. And I think this defaults to that five second cancellation period, but you can make it longer if you're a little slower on the draw to remember that you didn't want to send something. Um, you can set it to more seconds, give yourself a little bit more time to yank that email back before it really goes out into the world. You can enable or turn off Google's smart, quote unquote, smart features, such as autocorrect. Um, again, this is a personal preference. Some people find these really helpful, maybe especially if you're not a very fast typist. Um, it can be nice to have suggestions for replies you might wanna make that you can just click on instead of typing them out yourself. Personally, I find them really annoying because I don't want a computer to write my emails for me. Um, so I have them all turned off. But yeah, things like autocorrect, smart compose, smart compose personalization, smart reply. These are all ways that Google will sort of automatically suggest or personalize uh, replies and, um, and email content for you. So you can turn them off if you find those annoying like I do. There's also these nudges, which are reminders that Google will give you if you haven't responded to an email for a while. Again, this is very much personal preference. I find them annoying and I don't wanna be harassed by my own email, but I also totally understand people who love them because they help keep them organized, they help remind them, oh yeah, I was meaning to do something about that email. So just know it is in your power to check or uncheck those to have them on or off. You can customize the font size and style for all your emails. So we talked about those different composition tools when you have a new email open that you're typing, and that allows you to change things in that specific email, but this in your settings would allow you to change what it defaults to, so what it automatically is set to when you start an email. So if you want all of your email text to be bigger, or if you want it all to be blue, or if you want to change the font, um, and you want that to be how it starts out every single time without having to change it, you can go into your settings to this default text style and set it here. 
you can also add a signature to your email. So this would be just a set of text that you type in that appears at the end of every email message that you send. And it can be anything you want. Here's an example of my library email. I've got my name and title, as well as some contact information about the library. So those are all under that general section in settings. I am just gonna talk a little bit more about um, what's under the inbox section. So if you click inbox in your settings, you can find these. One thing you can do here is change the order that mail appears in your inbox. So by default, the newest mail is always gonna be at the top, but you can change it under this inbox type menu and set it to uh, things that are unread being all at the top or things that you've starred being all at the top. This again is gonna depend on what you've decided to do in terms of organization and what makes sense to you, but you've got a bunch of different options there. This is also where you can show or hide those important markers that we talked about before. And you can tell Gmail if you want not to use your past actions to predict what messages are important. Um, so if you find it a little creepy that they're monitoring your behavior to determine which messages you think are important, you can turn that off here. And if you're gonna do that, you sort of may as well turn off markers generally because you could use the star if you want to make all your own decisions about what has that bright color next to it. Also in your inbox settings, you can enable what's called reading pane view. So this uh, will make your email look a little bit more like some other email clients in that you'll have a list of messages in your inbox on the side and then either on the top or the bottom, depending on which one you pick. Um, an actual pane where you read the message. So you sort of see everything at once. You see both your inbox list of messages and the individual message you've selected. Uh, personally, I find this kind of intense and distracting, but uh, it's very much, again, a personal preference thing. So if you like the way that that looks, if that's something you're used to or you wanna try, you can enable that reading pane. And just a couple last things. If you go back to your inbox and click that gear icon again, you can select display density to change the way that messages look in your inbox, how, how spaced out they are. So you've got three options. Compact shows these really skinny lines for each message. Comfortable, they're a little bit wider. Uh, and then the default view, which it's set to unless you change it, uh, is the, the biggest view. So they take up the most space. Um, there's a lot of room between messages. You can also see on that default view, um, that bottom message, the attachments are showing up as little previews there that you can click on from the inbox. Whereas in the first two examples on that fourth message, there's just a paperclip icon over on the right by the date that indicates that there is an attachment, but you have to actually open the email message to see it. So those are a few differences between the views and again, that like most of this is just personal preference. What feels good to you? How do you like your inbox to look? You can also uh, minimize the left-hand sidebar by clicking on the little three line menu icon right above the compose button. And so that will take it from, you know, being the full sidebar with all of the categories listed out in text and shrink it down. So it's just a bunch of little icons. So personally, I leave mine uh, expanded out most of the time because I use it a lot. But if you prefer to have it be a little bit smaller and take up less room, you can just click on those three lines and that will shrink it down. So there you go. That's a lot of information. It's a lot of tools available through Google. And those are some of the most useful ones in my opinion. But if you'd like to learn more, I am doing another workshop soon about Google Drive, which you can sign up for on the library's calendar. And here's a couple other places where there's some good information about Gmail. Goodwill Community Foundation has tutorials on their website, including about Gmail. The Maine State Library has a good Gmail tutorial online as well. And then Google support pages are actually very helpful. Um, they're text-based, so you know you read through the steps and they're pretty comprehensive. If you're looking for instructions for how to do a specific thing or you've got a question, 
going to their support pages can be a great way to get specific directions click by click. If you've got further questions on this subject, I am available for one-on-one -on -one appointments with Blue Hill Library patrons. Uh, you can contact me. My information's all on the library's website, which is bhpl.net. I hope this tutorial was helpful for you and uh, that you learned something. And don't hesitate to get in touch if you've got any questions.